All right, so I'm following his notes. All right, I'm, I'm sure you all have a copy of those. And he wanted me to go back and take a look at the section. Um, Um, 6-2, that's what we're going to be covering today, and trig integrals and substitutions, and specifically page 34. So if you have that, go ahead and you can look at it. If you don't have it, look off your neighbor. And there are two boxed formulas there, right? Yes? Okay. And uh, the first one says the antiderivative of tan x is going to be natural log absolute value secant x, right, plus c. And Mr. Roy also told me that you had shown, that you had actually gone through this and did this in class. And the way that you did it, the standard way that we do it, is we rewrite tangent as sine x over cosine x. And then we use a basic u substitution. In this case, u would be cosine x, because the derivative of that is up here. And you can work through it. And after you're done with all that, you get this. So I'm not working back through this, all right? It's just to remind you that we have this formula. We will need it at some point. So be aware. Now, the other one below that is something that I'm going to talk a little more in depth about. So we have the antiderivative of secant x with respect to x. And if you follow the notes here, they have the box formula. But how do we get to that formula, right? Like, how do we actually get to that? And this is one of the, this is one of the more difficult integrals out there in a class like this. In fact, if I or Mr. Roy sent you home with that problem and you didn't have the internet, right? and you just had you and your brain, very slim odds that anyone's going to get this. And it probably took somebody, I don't know, we could maybe argue a lifetime. Uh, it's probably not. But um, this is a type of integral where somebody had to struggle with this for quite some time before they figured it out. And so when I go through the solution of how we get to the formula, I want you to no notice something in here that you have to do in order to make this work. And when you look at it, you're going to be like, OK, let's see. So first step all right, to this is to recognize that there's a hidden 1 right there. Now, we've always loved to have 1's next to everything, right? Anything times 1 is itself. And that 1, I can put anything over itself, right? And that's a 1. And what am I going to put? Do you all see it there? Secant x, right, plus tangent x over secant x plus tangent x dx. So it's like all of a sudden we're trying to solve this integral, right? We're trying to find what's the antiderivative of that. And we, we say, oh, just throw that in there. That's very strange, isn't it? That's what I'm saying. Someone had to really struggle to figure out that that's what they needed to insert into the problem in order to make it work. And then with all the different techniques that you have, right, you've learned um, the basic u substitution. You've learned the integration by parts, right? Those don't work, OK? Th those do not work. You have to insert a 1, and you've never had to do that before. But let's just see how it works. If you do this, if you come up, if you're clever enough to figure out that that's what you need to put in there, let's see what happens. So let's distribute the secant through, just through the top, right? And you get integral, let's see, secant squared x plus secant x tangent x all over secant x plus tangent x dx, right? That's just, just multiplication. And amazingly, because we did this, right, because we did this, do you see that if you choose u to be the denominator, right, basic substitution, if u is the denominator, what is the derivative of that? So what's the derivative of secant x? Secant x tangent x, right, plus what's the derivative of tangent x? Secant squared x. There it is. 
the derivative of the bottom is sitting right up there on top, and that's perfect. So Mr. Roy, when we were discussing me coming in here, wanted me to really stress to you that this is not just some trivial little thing. Like this took quite a bit of effort. And so people, any, if, you, if you're a math major, or if you're thinking about being a math major, this is the type of things that math majors have to do. They have a problem, they don't have a formula to go to, they have to sit there and torture themselves for days, weeks, months, years to try and come up with something that makes it work. All right? So we appreciate it. Thank you for whoever did that for us. Now we can come up and have a formula. All right? So make the substitution. Do you want me to work through that or can you follow this? Can you follow it? Yes? U is going to be this. Derivative that's right up there. So when we rewrite the integral, it's 1 over u du. And let's see, Mr. Roy wrote u to the negative 1 du, which either one, they're the same thing, right? Now, when you see that, do you automatically think natural log? Yeah. Yes, you should, right? When you see that, do you automatically think natural log? Yeah. Hopefully, yes. You should, you should be comfortable with both, all right? So from there, we go natural log, absolute value of, X, uh, absolute value of u plus c, and then replace u with what it was, and you're done. What do you all think of that? It works, right? But, you know, that's strange. Are there any, are there any other general ones besides secant x that are, we're going to have to plug in? There? You will never have to find this one. Not in this class, OK? In a class like this, you would never have to come up with this on your own. It's, this is just like, hey, check it out. Like, doesn't that suck Like, you, if you had to come up with that? Like, wouldn't that be very challenging? to come up with that? It's not obvious. You don't just sit there and look at it. I mean, someone had to really put time into this to figure out what would, what would work. So you won't be asked to. There are plenty of other formulas on the formulas in the back of the book that someone had to do something to get that formula, but we're just going to use the formula. All right? OK, now, moving on. Could somebody um, start a sign-in sheet? Uh, Mr. Roy didn't give me anything. I don't know if he normally even takes attendance, but um, do you mind just put your name, pass it around? All right. Done with this. We're moving on to page 35. OK, trigonometric substitutions. I call this trig sub, all right? What you've done, or what we've done prior to this, is that if you had an integral that had sines, cosines, tangents, secants, things like that inside the integrand, that we've had some ways of dealing with it, right? That's what the previous ideas within this section were. Now we, we transfer over to a different type of problem. So our problems are going to look very different, but what our goal is going to be to take those problems and turn them into trig integrals with sines and cosines and tangents and secants. So we have to be able to do all the stuff in the first part of the section to be able to handle something like what we're going to do now. So there is a big shift right now. We're going to go from one concept to another. And they're going to look different, but they're going to be connected. So with trig substitutions, there's a table on the top here. And it gives, let's start out with this, square root of a squared minus x squared. So the idea is this. If we see an integral, right, if we have some integral, and inside that integrand, we see an expression that looks something like this, right? It might be in the numerator, it might be in the denominator, just somewhere within the integrand, and we're having trouble finding the antiderivative, like nothing that we've done up to this point works, we can try and use this thing called trigonometric substitution. And what we're going to do is we're going to go in here and we're going to replace our variable x with something. We're going to make a substitution. And the substitution we make does not seem very natural. Right? Can you tell from that table what the, we call it the inverse substitution is going to be? x is going to be a sine theta. And we have some restrictions here on our theta. 
These restrictions, do they look familiar to you? Yeah, that's your restrictions from your arc sine, right? Your inverse sine function. We had some domain restrictions. Those domain restrictions are still in play here. All right, so th think about this. This is weird. We have an integrand or an integral. Within the inter integrand, we've got some expression like this. We can't figure out the antiderivative. So all of a sudden, we go in and replace that, that little x right there with a sine theta, which is a more complicated expression, isn't it? I mean, x is x. Replacing with a sine theta seems like that might, might be more, like more of a headache, right? But it actually helps us. And let's see why it helps us. Let's take this expression right here, and let's figure out what it would be if we replaced the x with a sine theta. What would we have here? a squared there, right? Minus. Now what happens if you square the x? What do you get? a squared sine squared theta. Forgot the square. You could write a sine theta, and you could say squared, right? You could do that. But I'm going to go ahead, since there's multiplication, just square each one. That fair? Now, what do both of the terms underneath the root have in common? They both have an a squared, right? So you could actually factor an a squared out, right? And then you'd be left with here 1 minus sine squared theta. Agreed? You'll see what I did there? And what's 1 minus sine squared theta? Cosine squared theta. So this is actually square root of a squared cosine squared theta. And that could also be looked at as a cosine theta, that quantity squared, which is just, when you take the square root of something squared, you get what's underneath there, right? Now, technically, we need it to be an absolute value. All right? Y'all OK with that? So because of our domain restrictions, think of our domain restriction. Theta is between negative pi over 2 and 2. So if you look at a unit circle, you're not allowed to play over in those quadrants, right? Only in the first and the fourth quadrant. So tell me about cosine in that quadrant. It's going to be positive, right? And so this is going to be a positive quantity. And A here, this right here, is also going to be positive. Now, the reason, the reason why is because the original expression, right? Let me show you an example of this. If I had like 9 minus x squared, do you all see that A would be 3, <coughs> right? And no matter what, if I'm going to look at this number as a perfect square, 16 minus x squared, then a would have to be 4. We don't have to worry about a being negative. Does that make sense? Yes? OK. So this just turns into a cosine theta. I just want to point out that you know, technically, when you take the square root of something squared, it's absolute value of, of, the, of the thing that's squared. Right? So what's, what's happening is we're, we're taking a rather complicated expression that has roots in it. And you know, we know that there's problems with roots when we're doing antiderivatives. And somehow, after we do this weird substitution, at the end of the day, it just turns out to be a cosine theta. And can you in integrate this? I hope so, right? That's pretty clean. The only thing is, when you're done, you're going to have to switch back to x. Because your variable is now theta. You're going to switch back to x. That makes sense? And we can do that anytime we see an expression that has this root in it, we can do this substitution. Now, if this is changed a little bit, let's see, the one below it has a plus between them, right? And I forgot to point out or ask you, the key to this working was the step right here, wasn't it? Where we pulled the a squared out, and this right here was a Pythagorean identity. And that allowed us to get it to, instead of two different terms, it allowed us to get it to a single term, and then take the square root, and we were in business, right? So if we change this, if our radicand, again, I mean, sorry, integrand, if instead it has a plus in there, then this won't work. Because if this is plus, do you all see what I'm saying? If that's a plus, the Pythagorean identity does not work for that. Agreed? 
So we can't use A sine theta. We have to use something else. What do we use? A tangent theta. And again, we have some domain restrictions. Are you all understanding kind of the idea of it? Like, we're going to take something complicated, try and turn it into a trig integral. This substitution we are making is called a trig trigonometric substitution. We are replacing our variable with the trig function, trig substitution. All right. Do you all want me to work this one out and show what this one turns into? Yes or no? Yes? Yes. yes? OK, so what does this one turn into? Well, let's rewrite that expression over there with the plus. This one would turn into root a squared plus, I'm replacing x with a tan theta, so it becomes a squared tan squared theta. And again, factor out your a squared. What's left in there? 1 plus tangent squared theta. Now, I think, I hope everyone was comfortable with that 1 minus sine squared theta was cosine squared theta. You may not be as comfortable with that, but it's even written down here for you, in case you've forgotten. That's another one of the Pythagorean identities. This is just secant squared theta, right? So this becomes a squared secant squared theta. And then we can do the same thing. We can take the square root of something squared, and we're going to get absolute value again, right? So it'll turn into this after we look at the domain restrictions. So with the, I, mean, I don't want to write all these domain restrictions down, but with those domain restrictions, then this secant theta would always have to be positive, and we would, again, still be in business. OK? The last one, I think I'll leave for you to work through yourself. The, the trig sub, if this is, uh, what's the difference here? It's not a squared minus x squared. It's not a squared uh, plus x squared. It's actually x squared minus a squared. So your variable's in front, like that. That trig substitution is going to be a secant theta. OK? I've had students in the past ask me, look, what if I have a squared minus x squared, I'm supposed to use a sine theta, right? But can't I just like rewrite this and like factor out a negative and then write it as the x squared minus a squared? I mean, that's the same, that's the same thing, isn't it? Like if I distribute this through, I get back <coughs> this? Yes? OK, so why can't I do that? Yeah, what's that, what are you going to do with the negative, right? The negative, you're not going to be able to take the root of it. So, all right. OK. So let's do this. I'm doing, we're going to do this example, example 10. So I usually take off 10 points on an exam for students that sleep in my class. I'm sure Mr. Roy doesn't have that policy. But I always give them an opportunity to redeem themselves. So if you're sleeping, obviously you can do this. Yes. Okay, so I want to do it both ways. I'm just trying to engage you so that you can wake up. So I want to do it two ways. All right, so if you were going to do this one without the trig substitution, what method would you approach it with? Uh, Yes? Okay, so what, what would you use for your basic substitution? Uh, um, let u equal six, 16 minus x squared. u is 16 minus x squared? Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. u equal 2x. Okay. okay. Um, and you just replace. So u x cubed, you can rewrite into x squared times x. Yes, okay. Very good. So I'm going to make sure everyone's on board with this. The two different ways to approach this. Mr. Roy wanted me to make sure you could see that there are two ways to do this. This is one way. We're seeing a derivative, we're seeing a, a u as the radicand. Mm -hmm. 
and then we are going to take derivative, but we have to split the x cubed up. So you split the x cubed up as x squared. Um, again, we, pro we might use different notation the way that we do things here, but I think you want to like peel off an x, something like that, so you can kind of see the x dx here. Is that look right. about right what you all do? And so this should be okay. This should be our u, right? This is going to be, what is that? Uh, yeah, how about we just scale this both sides like this? We just scale both sides by negative two, or, and that way this matches up exactly, right? So this is accounted for, this is accounted for, and then the last thing you just have to take that and solve it for x squared. Sure. Yep. Okay. Good. See, don't you feel more awake now? No. Still tired? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, so that will replace our x squared on top. And let's see what this new integral becomes. We've got the x squared on top, which is 16 minus u. And then the bottom is just going to be root u. u to the half, however you want to do it. I'm going to do u to the half. And then this last part, du, but then the negative 1 half, I can pull out front, right? And then for this, Split it into two separate fractions, power rule, and you're done. Yes? Not so bad. That actually worked. Yeah? OK. But let's try this with this different method. And after we do the different method, you're going to be like, well, why would I do that if I can do that? Right? The reason is because there are some problems you can't do this, but the other method works. So this is just to make you believe in it right now, OK? Do you want me to finish or no? 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 Just to let him. You want to see it? Okay. So negative one half integral. I'm doing uh, 16 u to the negative one half. So I'm splitting this into two fractions. I'm gonna put that in parentheses because I have two terms. And then I have to do minus u over this, which is u to the half. So just exponent rules. One here, one minus a half is a half, and then du. And then you can do those piece by piece. Yeah? Keep that up there. Let me see how much detail he's showing here. I'm just not quite sure how much detail he wants me to go to. Um, I, I'll do this one. I guess we take the time. All right, that will be equal to, let's see, what's the antiderivative of this? Let's just look at that right there. What's the antiderivative of that? 2u to the half, right? 2u to the half, but then you have times 16, but then times that. So negative 16, u to the half, right? And then antiderivative of this, 2 thirds u to the 3 halves. I mean, I'll, I'll actually write that down. We still have this out front, right? This and then times that negative will be plus. You said it was two thirds u to the three halves plus constant. Follow? And then these go away. So we should get um, negative 16. What was u, by the way? So 16 minus x squared. Hey times x squared to the half, and then plus a third, and then 16 minus x squared to the 3 halves plus c. That look good? All right. Now, let's do it the other way. So we look back at this integrand, right? And we see in here the radical, right? And we see that radical. We see, does that look like a squared minus x squared, a squared plus x squared, or x squared plus a squared, or minus a squared? A squared minus x squared. So we, we notice that this right here looks like the form a squared minus x squared. And when we see that underneath the root, right? So when we see that, we're thinking trig substitution. And the substitution we're going to make is? 
x is equal to a sine theta, right? In this case, a is 4. So I'm actually ready to start the substitution. This was just kind of laying out the template for myself. x is equal to 4 sine theta, right? Now, if I'm going to switch this in terms of theta, right, if this is going to have theta in it now, then I can't have dx out there either because I'm going to have thetas and x's mixed up. So I've got to figure out what dx is. What am I going to replace it with? So let's take the derivative of this, just like we've been doing in the past. dx is going to be 4 cosine theta d theta. So same sort of thing that we've done in the past when we made just basic substitutions. We would say like u is this and then du and work it through. Okay, so we've got that. And then the last thing we need to figure out is what is that whole square root of 16 minus x squared going to turn into? So remember when I put this on the board initially and we worked through it and I said, the reason why we do this is because a squared minus x squared equals, and we worked through it all, and at the end we said a what? a cosine theta, didn't we? a cosine theta. Right, we replaced that with a sine theta, we factored out the a squared, we used a Pythagorean identity, we did square root of something squared, and it all turned out to be a cosine theta, didn't it? So that means that anywhere I see this root with 16 minus x squared, in this case it's going to be what? 4 cosine theta. Does everyone make, uh, does this make sense to everyone? You identify what the trig substitution is, you make the substitution, you differentiate, and you figure out what that radical part's going to turn into. Once you have all these pieces, you rewrite the integral. So let's rewrite it. So this integral right here now becomes integral, let's see. Let's start with the easier things first. What about the bottom here, this root? What's that radical, this whole thing going to be? Four cosine theta. What is dx going to turn into? Four cosine theta d theta. So I'm going to just tack it on like this. Four cosine theta d theta. And what does x cubed become? Yeah, there's x, right? So cube both sides. So it's, four, it's this cubed and that cubed, right? So I'll just put it as 4 cubed what? sine cubed theta. Just don't forget that you have to cube both of them, all right? You have to cube the 4 and the sine. And that's it. Everything's rewritten, right? And you look at that initially and you're like, well, that doesn't look very good. But do you see all the things that happen that are nice? 4 cosine theta, 4 cosine theta are gone. The 4 cubed is a constant, so that can come out. I think in the notes it's written as 4 cubed, right? Yes. Okay. Integral, what's left? Sine cubed theta d theta. And do you see why now the previous section was important? You've got to be able to do this. So what is sine cubed? How do we handle this one? Factor out one sine. Okay, so I'm going to factor out one factor of sine. And that tells me kind of that this right here is going to be my, like the du part, which means my u is going to have to be cosine. And that's not cosine, so we use a Pythagorean identity to switch it to cosine. So now we're at. That that's equal to 4 cubed integral Pythagorean identity. Sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared theta. Sine theta d theta. Now, u, make our substitution, u. So this is the second substitution I've made, isn't it? Mm -hmm. My first substitution got me from x to theta. Now I'm going theta to u, which means I'm going to need to go all the way back to x at some point. So u is going to be what? Cosine theta. du then 
negative sine theta, d theta. And we don't like the minus here, right? Because we don't have a minus here. So is that the way y'all took care of it? Is that the way he's showing you? Just change it? Yes? OK. If I do anything that looks like totally foreign, just let me know, all right? Um, and now I should be able to rewrite the integral, right? So this is going to become 1 minus u squared. That's going to become negative du, but I'm going to pop the negative out now. So we've got negative 4 thirds, uh, 4 thirds, sorry, 4 to the third integral 1 minus u squared du. We almost there? Integrate. So negative 4 to the third. We can take the antiderivative of each one term by term. So you have u here minus a third u cubed. And then plus your constant of integration. And now comes the part where you replace everything. So what was u? Cosine theta. So I'm going to go back in here, four, negative 4 to the third. I've got cosine theta minus a third cosine cubed theta, and then plus c. Would you agree that this method is a little bit more, more involved than the, the first method we did? Right, The first method was a lot cleaner, definitely a lot cleaner. But like I said, this method will work for some things the other method won't work on. All right, now what? I've got to get cosine theta back to something with x, right? So where am I going to go to figure that out? Back to the original. What do you mean by that? My, OK, so we're going to always go back to the original trig substitution we made. The original trig substitution that we made was what? x is equal to a sine theta. So it was 4 sine theta, right? From this equation, which we put in ourselves, we will always create a reference triangle. Right? Reference triangles are things that we use as a reference to help us, right? So if I take this and I, I, I um, isolate the sine theta by dividing both sides by 4, then this equation has a geometric representation also. Like I can represent this equation geometrically by drawing a right triangle. Now when I draw this right triangle, we know from pre-cal that when you draw right triangles, you can be in different quadrants. But because our restriction on theta, remember we could only play in which quadrants? One and four. For, the, for this particular trig sub, it's in these two quadrants, that we should be able to determine which quadrant this thing needs to be in. Why quadrant one? Because the x is positive. I mean, the x, yeah, the x can't be negative, right? right? Yeah, let me draw something and then we'll talk. I think you're on the right track. If I draw a right triangle here like this, right, and this is my theta, okay? So I'm using the, the argument of this trig function, the angle here is theta. Sine of theta is always defined to be what over what? Opposite over hypotenuse. <coughs> so this is opposite, the opposite side is x, right? And the hypotenuse is 4. Agreed? Like this? Now, what about cosine theta? See, this, this reference tri triangle gives us something to look at to try and figure out all the other trig values of theta. Like I could say, what's tangent theta? What's um, secant theta? Everything is off this triangle. The missing piece to this is what? To get cosine, I'm going to need which side of this? The adjacent side. So do we all know how to solve for the adjacent side here? I hope so. I, Mr. Roy wanted me to do it one time. So. Let's just call this, um, let's call this side, I don't want to call it A because we've already used an A here. So why don't I just call it C, is that all right? C. So by the Pyth uh, Pythagorean identity, right, we have like 
a squared plus b squared is c squared, that thing, but I'm using different letters. So it's c squared plus x squared equals 4 squared, right? And if you solve this for c, we'll move the x squared to the other side. Do you all see something familiar? When you take the root of c squared on both sides, you should get plus or minus here, but we're only going to use the plus because C has to be positive if we're in the first or fourth quadrants, right? That looks familiar. That's actually what we were looking at in the very beginning of the problem that made us do the trig substitution. So when you do these problems and you work through them and you draw your reference triangle, you're always going to have a missing side. That missing side will always be the thing you had been looking at in the very beginning of the problem. Or you just look at this and say, oh yeah, I can solve for that side, 16 minus x squared, and I'm done. All right? Okay. We're, we're, we're there. We just need to actually plug things back in. So I'm going to continue from this answer right here. We have the <coughs> negative 4 to the third. And then we have cosine theta. Just look off that triangle. What's cosine theta? Root 16 minus x squared. All that over 4. OK, that's cosine theta. That's adjacent over hypotenuse. And then minus 1 third times. And then that cosine theta again, but this time cubed. Right? Cube it. So how about this? We take this 16 minus x squared all over 4 and cube it. I'm, I'm done, right? That's it? I mean, plus the c, of course, yes. Plus c. Any questions there? Now let's see. Let's see, take it further than this. Factor out some stuff. So now it's just some algebra, all right? Any questions? What's, y'all all right? Okay. Do y'all want me to work through this algebra? Um, he didn't, right? He did? Okay. All right. So y'all okay with that then? We just leave it like that? Be happy? All right, let's look at another one. All right, so this one, there is no way you're doing it with a basic U substitution. Would integration by parts work? I mean, if we did integration by parts, your only real choice for, right on integration by parts, you have to choose something to be your u and something to be your dv. Your only real choice for u would be this, right? And the derivative of that would be kind of messy, and then dv would have to be the dx. You could mess with it, okay? You could play with that on, you know, see what happens. but. We're not going to try that. So do we all recognize one of the three forms for the trig sub? This is the first one again, right? This is a squared minus x squared. So what is my substitution going to be? 3 sine theta. Once I do that, I differentiate it. dx is 3 cosine theta, d theta. And one more thing, you taking off? Okay. One more thing is to figure out what's that root 9 minus x squared going to be. And you could work it out. Like if you wanted to, you could plug the x in and work it all out. But 
It's going to be the same thing that happened last time. Three cosine theta. So anytime you make a trig substitution of, of a sine theta, your square root part is always going to be a cosine theta. Now that's not on that table that he gave you, right? That's not there. Right? It's not? I want to make sure it's not on there. Yeah, it's not. All right, so from that I should be able to rewrite this, right? Okay. So this will become, sorry, I know Mr. Roy moves around the room, doesn't he? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I try to keep everything in camera frames, so I have to stay like in one spot. All right, so this is going to be what? Three cosine. Three cosine theta. And you're not done. What's dx? Three cosine theta. Three cosine theta d theta, right? Good. And what can you do with that? Pull out 9, right? 9 comes out. And now you're hopefully at a place you're happy to be at. <coughs> cosine squared. And you know how to handle cosine squared? Half angle identity, right? So if you ever saw like cosine squared or sine squared, you, you should be thinking like half angle identities or power reducing formulas. And if you see cosine or sine odd, you should be thinking pull a, pull a sine out or a cosine out and use Pythagorean identities. That's what we did on the previous problem. So this one, half angle. So that becomes 9 and then just this, what does that turn into? 1 half. 1 plus cosine 2 theta and then d theta. Pull the half out. Yeah? Pull the half out. So 9 halves, integral 1 plus cosine 2 theta <coughs> d theta. <coughs> and can you integrate each of these? Yeah, these should be pretty clean, right? Just be careful with your variable. What's the antiderivative of 1 with respect to theta? It's just theta, right? And then for this one, we have to be a little careful with some constants. So continuing over here, we have that that's equal to uh, 9 halves. I'm going to put parentheses and go ahead and get the antiderivatives. Uh, antiderivative 1, you just said, was theta. And then antiderivative of cosine 2 theta. One half, right? One half sine 2 theta plus one half sine 2 theta. That's the antiderivative of cosine uh, 2 theta. And we're done, right? Plus c. I mean, I'm sorry, <laughs> I keep on saying that. We're done as far as taking the antiderivative. You must always get your variable back to x. Maybe I'll do this. Just to get rid of those parentheses, how about 9 halves theta uh, plus 9 fourths sine 2 theta plus c. That's just distributing, right? All right. So we've kind of hit a po point now where we need to do a little thinking. When we're trying to get the theta stuff back to the x, this is where that reference triangle usually comes into play. But we have a problem. Does anyone see what the problem is? We have sine 2 theta. And our triangle doesn't tell us anything about sine 2 theta. So it's going to be 2 sine theta, cosine theta? Yes. We can use some identities, though, to turn that back into things that involve just theta, not 2 theta. Um, I'll do that in a second. I just want to make sure you recognize that that's not a straightaway easy thing. We, we have to I recognize the identity first. So let me go ahead and on the side here, just put my reference triangle together. Just even if I don't need it, it's for practice. So my initial substitution was x here was, I forgot, 3 sine, three sine theta. And from that, I can create the equation x over 3 is sine theta. 
And from that, I can create my reference triangle. Theta is always the angle. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. And automatically, the missing side becomes that radical thing, right? So again, we may not need this, but you should get into the habit of, of just being able to throw that up there real quick, all right? Now, let's start with this first piece. I need to know what theta is. Not what cosine theta is, not what sine theta is. I need to know what theta is. And I need it in terms of x. I have to solve for theta, right? So if I come in, I look at all this, right here, this equation, I could get theta by itself if I come in on both sides of this equation with the inverse, arc sine, right? So using this piece right here, and this is kind of like a little more scratch work, I know that arc sine of x over 3 would be equal to arc sine of sine theta, and this side just turns out to be theta. So, so that's what theta is, right? Theta is arc sine of x over 3. I've got theta turned back to something that has x's in it. Right? That's all I needed to do to get this. So I'm going to replace that with arc sine of x over 3. Then this part, 2 theta, again, this tells you about sine theta, not two, uh, 2 theta. So we use the identity. that sine 2 theta is 2 times sine theta cosine theta plus c. And that's just going to turn that back into a 9 halves instead of a 9 fourths, right? I'm going to go one more line, and then I'm going to plug everything in. We good? All right, so this was scratch work. This over here was kind of scratch work. Plugging in, it's going to look kind of nasty, but it is 9 halves theta, which is arc sine of x over 3, plus 9 halves times sine theta. We can go off of this, or it was up there, right? It's x over 3 times cosine theta. This over 3, adjacent over hypotenuse. Square root 9 minus x squared over 3 plus c. Any questions? I'm not done. I'm going to clean it up. But any questions on where any of that came from? Sure. All right, let's clean it up. 9 halves arc sine x over 3 plus, what's over there? Yeah, we should get the 3, the 9, the 3, 3 to cancel like that. Yeah. So we should just get a, like a 1 half. So I'm going to write it like this, 1 half of x root 9 minus x squared plus c. That's it. That is the antiderivative. Questions? It's a rather nasty looking antiderivative considering how simple the integrand looked, right? It was just root 9 minus x squared. And it turns out to be this ugly big old thing. Let me see if Mr. Roy wants me to check that. I don't see. He always checks it? All right. <laughs> don't you? No? Not so much? It just makes you better at differentiation, but all right, I'll check it. Um, we do have time, so all right, constant in front. I'm just checking derivative of this. So constant's going to come for the ride here. Derivative of arc sine of something is 
what, 1 over square root of 1 minus whatever's in there, the argument, squared, right? So that's going to be x squared over 9, because I'm squaring this. Am I done? I need the derivative of what's in here also now, chain rule. So derivative of what's in there is 1 third. Okay, that's just derivative of this. Plus, I have a product right here. There's a product rule between 1 half x and this root. So when I use the product rule, I do derivative of this one times this one plus derivative of this one times that one. So derivative of this is a half times that root plus, now the derivative of this root should be 1 over 2 roots times the derivative of what's inside times this and I'm done with the derivative. And somehow, some way, this is supposed to turn out to be this, right? All right. So let's see. This right here and this right here go away. That becomes a 3 halves, right? 3 halves? 3 halves, um, right this way, times 1 over. Now, one more thing I'm going to do here. I'm going to get a common denominator between these two. So 9, so I put a 9 on top and 9 on bottom. When I do that, I'm going to turn it into root 9 minus x squared over 9. Agreed? And now I can pull the 9 on the bottom out as a 3 on the bottom. So that can be like a 1 third coming out of this. Do that on the next step. Can I do that on the next step? But that's where I'm headed with this. That's why I did it. I wanted to make this, an, uh, this thing look like a 9 minus root x, or 9 minus x squared. And then plus over here, can't do really much with that. And then over here, what do we have? Twos cancel. What's on top? Negative x squared. So how about minus, and then we have x squared over 2 roots 9 minus x squared. Here's another way I can do this that might make it a little easier to see, just in case you can't see it. This right here, I can write that as a root over a root like that, a fraction. Then 1 over a fraction means it flips. And so really, this is going to turn into 3 over that root. Got it? So that will really be 9 halves, and then 1 over root. 9 minus x squared plus 1 half root 9 minus x squared and then minus x squared over 2 root 9 minus x squared. This doesn't look like it's the right thing, right? But I think we have some more algebra to do. What can we do? Pull out a half out of all these? All right, that makes me... Happy, I'll do that, no problem. Pull a half out. Okay, what else can I do? This, the only one that doesn't have that root thing in the bottom is this one, right? Could I get a common denominator between all of them? That way I could put them all together? I could, right? Let me, let me do this. Let me rewrite it just the way we have it here. 9 times 1 over root 9 minus x squared plus root 9 minus x squared and then minus x squared over root 9 minus x squared. That's where, that's where I'm at. I've pulled the 1 half out. What I was suggesting is we get a common denominator here, right? That's over 1. Let's introduce a root 9 minus x squared on top and bottom here. And I do that, what am I going to get on top? 9 minus x squared, right? It's going to go away. So this will be equal to half 9 
times 1 over root 9 minus x squared plus 9 minus x squared over root 9 minus x squared minus x squared over root 9 minus x squared. Done. Okay. Now I can put them all together, right? Actually, I'll slide that 9 on top right here. And when I put them together and combine all those numerators up, what do I get? 18 minus 2x squared. Yes? So I have on the top 18 minus 2x squared over root 9 minus x squared. What can I factor out of the top? Pop a 2 out? 2 out and that half's gone. So what's left on top if I pull the 2 out? 9 minus x squared, and if you like, to the first power over this, which is really to the half power, right? Y'all see it? We're there? To the half. It works. A little bit of algebra, but it works. A little bit. Yeah. Any questions? Very powerful substitution that we have. Now, I haven't, haven't shown you any of the other ones, right? So I think probably the next example will have one of the other ones. Let's see. All right, integral. This is the last one on the notes, right? Integral dx over root... 9 plus x squared. X is tan theta. Okay. So, well, yes, a tan theta. So we're looking off of that chart, right? This looks like the a squared plus x squared, which means that I should make the substitution x is equal to a, which in this case is 3, tangent theta. So I'm not using sine this time. I take the derivative. 3 secant squared theta d theta. And then my question now is, what does that root thing turn into? 3 secant theta. Does anyone have a question why that turns in that? Okay, because you need to, I mean, that, that, you don't want to be sitting there during a test like, okay, I don't remember like what it goes to. You need to know where it comes from. So you all are clear with it? All right, rewrite it. You got everything you need. So this should become dx. Don't forget the dx. Very important. It's the 3 secant squared d theta, right? So I've got 3 secant squared theta d theta on top. On the bottom, the root is 3 secant theta. 3's cancel. Secant cancels, a factor of secant. And so you are left with integral secant theta d theta. And what is the antiderivative of secant theta? Yeah, this is that one that we started class with that we said someone had worked their whole life to figure out. Now we get to, we get to use it, right? So this is equal to natural log, absolute value secant theta plus tangent theta close off that absolute value plus C. But we're not done. Right? What's next? Yeah, we got to get these back to X's, right? So reference triangle, I can make it off, I make it off of this right here. 
So let's do a little quick reference trial triangle. I'll do it right here. Why don't you use the pick identity to resolve it? Because that'll be easier. Well, you, okay, you can do, look, right now I already know what secant theta is, right? Look at this right here. Secant theta, divide by three, I'm there, right? There's a lot of things that I can do to be easier. I agree with you. What I'm trying to do is show you something that's like kind of a standard practice. And then once you start seeing things faster, you can get them. But we need something that's always going to work. This is something that will never fail you if you draw your reference triangle. Right, and I'm sure the exams are a lot harder than this, this one because it's kind of simple. Yeah. It, th this is just, this is the standard protocol, but they're usually within our work, there's information here that we can just see it in there. But sometimes it's not, so we need something like this. But uh, let me see, I'm going to go here. Um, I'm using this, x over 3 is tan theta, and tangent is by definition opposite, opposite over adjacent, and that forces this side to be that root part. 9 plus x squared. And now we can get all six trig functions off that. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. So natural, <laughs> natural log, natural log uh, secant theta, which we said is hypotenuse over adjacent, right? So root 9 plus x squared over 3. And then plus tangent theta which is again x over 3, right? x over 3 plus c. And that, I mean, yes, you could say that that's the answer, but there's a little more work that you could do. Um, you could do, these have the same denominator, so you could put them together, couldn't you? I know that doesn't seem like much more work to do, right? But there's also something else you can do after that. plus x over 3 plus c, right? One more thing. Does anyone see what else we could do? Uh, the 3 can't come out of the log, but we do want to do something with that. Good. I don't need the absolute value on that 3, but I'm going to put it. So this is property of logs. If you have a logarithm that has division inside, you can split it into two logarithms with subtraction. That's just college algebra property of logs. And the reason why we want to show you that is because what is natural log of 3? It's a number, right? It's constant. And if, I, if I'm going to say that the answer is this plus any constant, then I don't even need that there. What I can do is say, hey, look, all of this together, right, is just a C. Now, I think in uh, Mr. Roy's notes, he does it, he wants me to actually label this as C1. Call it C1. You could call it C2 or CM. It doesn't matter. It's just that's that constant right here is a combination of some constant we didn't know in natural log of 3 being subtracted. So natural log. Square root, 9 plus x squared plus x, close that off, uh, plus c1. And Mr. Roy also told me that um, y'all did not get into the in inverse hyperbolic trig functions that much? That y'all did not really talk too much about the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. You did talk about hyperbolic trig functions, right? But not their inverses. It turns out that there are some formulas that you could take something like this. That's the problem we just did, uh, did right? And that this answer is just sine hyperbolic inverse of x, x over 3. So like if you were to go to the back of the book that has all these formulas in it, like the back of your book has all these formulas, you might find a formula in there that said something like this, du 
over square root of a squared plus x squared, um, I switched it to x, sorry, that that is equal to hyperbolic sine <coughs> inverse of u over 3, uh, u over a plus c. And he just wanted me to point out that there are shorter ways to get from there to an answer, but it involves some functions that you haven't really talked too much about. That's all. That, that this sort of thing exists out there. All right. Well, I'm sure Mr. Roy would never let you go early. He always lets you go 30 minutes early, right? Um, you do have a homework question. Let me do one more thing, and then I'll, ask, I'll talk about the homework question. Look, everyone in here should have no problem with this right here, right? What's the answer to that? Hmm. Maybe I spoke too soon. That's not one you recognize as one that you need to know? Arctan. This is our tangent. This is our tan x, right? Yeah. Why? Because someone told you, right? Because <laughs> it's a formula. Okay, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you why. And we're going to use trig sub to do it. All right? So for the trig sub, I said what we're looking for is this. Right? It's either a squared minus x squared, x squared minus a squared, or x squared plus a squared, and that could be either way. So which of those three do we have there? Well, I don't see a root, or do I? What, I, what you would need to see here to use trig substitution, look, do you all understand we're acting like we don't know the antiderivative of this is arctangent of x? We're acting like we don't? All right, so we are going to go and rewrite this as the square root of 1 plus x squared that quantity squared dx. That's true, right? Now, do you see that piece there? Okay, what substitution do we use when we have x squared plus a squared or a squared plus x squared? x is what? a tan theta. So in our case, it would be 1 times tan theta. I don't need the 1. I'm just pointing it out. That's your a. Take the derivative. What's dx? Secant squared theta d theta, right? And what's the square root of the 1 plus x squared going to become? It's a secant theta again. So just secant theta. Yeah? OK. Rewrite it. Rewrite this. What do you get? 1 over. What is the square root of 1 plus x squared? That's secant theta, and I'm going to square, square it. So the bottom is secant squared theta, right? That's the bottom. And then what's dx? Secant squared theta, d theta. That's it? Oh, this is weird. Uh-oh. Theta plus c? What's theta? Solve that for theta. What do you get? Arctan, both sides? Ah, it's arctan x. That's where the formula comes from. You could do that for pretty much all the different formulas that you're given. The ones, like, the, like even, the, even the one that's, well, I'm trying to think. I don't know what you all have seen, so. This one I'm pretty sure you have, right? Yeah. Now, do you see how it's just a, just a simple application of this technique? Yes. OK. Um, have you all talked about what would happen if you change this 1 to a 4? Have you all talked about that at all? Yeah, so let's think about how it would change it. Let's, let's do this. If I, that's a 1, right? Let's, just, let's change it to a 2, and I'll do it in a different color. If I change this to a 4, how does that change this? This is now a 2, right? Which means you'll have a 2 here. And then this will also have a 2 here, right? 
Now, when I put that here and I square it, right, what am I going to have here instead? Four secant squared theta. What am I going to have here? Careful. Just the two secant squared. So I'm just going to have the two, right? So I'm actually going to have out here a one half, right? And then I'm going to have a one half here, which means it's going to be one half arctangent of x, right? Uh, no, no, sorry, hold on. I had a two, I had a two here. This would be x over two. So I knew I was, I knew I was missing something there. X over two. Following? Plus c. And then in general, if you have any number squared here, so like if this is a squared, then your formula through here is just going to be 1 over a arctan of x over a. And I believe that's the formula that's, that's in the back. Okay? So that, again, you could get that general formula by just replacing that with a. Okay, what was the homework question? Okay, 3 tan squared x times secant, just secant x, dx. All right. So can I ask you what you were thinking of doing? Okay, let me do that first. Uh, three, you just pulled the three. Okay, so three came out. You rewrote tangent squared as secant squared x minus one, and then secant x dx, yes? Yes. And then you distribute your secant through. You split it up, okay. Everyone see what, what's going on here at least, yes? Yeah. All right, I'm just following your lead right now and then we'll see where you got hung up. So three secant cubed x dx minus three integral secant x dx. I guess that's where you are? No, I'm further than that. Okay, I mean I'm saying yes, that's yeah, where we are here and then now? And then I took the secant x, I did the integral. Use the formula, no? Yes, that, and, but I'm saying that came from that formula that I was talking about in the beginning of class, yes. right? Okay, so yeah, I'm gonna put a check mark next to that. That's done. And I'm stuck right there with the, the two. Yep, okay. So, like I wanna take the secant square and then just have secant, mm -hmm. um, and then pull it into like a tangent, I don't know. Are you not, like, oh yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. This is very common, pro common question, common, a common, like point that you get stuck. So let's, let's all agree first that the trouble, forget the three, okay? Let's just forget the three. The, the trouble is just this integral right here, right? Can we all agree on that? And just look at that as its own little problem right now and see if we can't figure out what it is. You wanna peel off a secant. I can, I can see that's, I think what you were saying like, but if you peel off a secant, what do you do with the other part, right? I think, like if I peel off a secant like that, then one of these is the derivative. Are you trying to do like a basic substitution now? Um, I'm just trying to get into your mind. So I, my, mind I'm, my mind thought was like, okay, well the secant square could be a one tangent square, a one plus tangent okay. square. Okay. Yeah. So that's, I don't know where my, I don't know what my thought process should be. And you're, you're right. Yeah. There's, so this is the thing about these, and I, I'm sure Mr. Roy has made this clear, is that, you know, there is no cookie cutter method for, to any of this, right? You just have to try something. So if you're, I'm going with what your instinct was, and I'm going to keep going with it, all right? I'm going to keep going with it until we get to a point where we either get it or we're stuck, 
Okay, so this is going to become, you rewrote this as 1 plus tangent squared x secant x dx. Yep, so secant x and then plus, we, we'll be able to split this into two integrals again. All right. You pull the secant out, but you're back to tangent squared x secant x. So it's there again. I know, that's where I'm at right now. Okay, so do you remember a problem where you had, did you ever have a problem where you did an integral like this one. Yeah. And like you would have to do an integration by parts twice and showed up on the other side and then you could move it over. Yes. Did you try that? On this one? Because mm -hmm. yeah. it just showed up on the other side, didn't it? Yes. I wonder if that's a good thing. Because if it showed up on the other side, could you move it over back yeah. to the left side? See, I, I, now I don't have it all written out, so. Right, no, I do. But that might, will it move to the other side? Yes. Can you change the secant x to a 1 over cosine? Sure. Well, for the antiderivative of this? Well, that we know. That we know the antiderivative of. That was on the formula. So that's already been, that's already been worked out. That was that one that someone suffered for us to have a formula on. So I, I would encourage you to try that to see if it works. I want to see if, and I, I can work well, yeah. it if you want. But so my thought process to this point is great. Yeah, I mean, this is a very natural place to get to on this, where you see it happen again, and you're like, what the hell? It, you know, like I'm back to where I started. Um, but I would mess with it a little more. Are there any other approaches that anyone else took to this, or to the original problem? Well, since it's uh, from where we got to the second, to the third, mm -hmm. since it's, like an odd exponent, mm -hmm. shouldn't we be able to substitute it out? Well, that's normally going to work if it's like a sine or a cosine. That would normally work. Can you change it into sine and cosine? It, yes, you could do sine and cosine, but then it would be cosine to the negative 3 power. So you wouldn't be able to really pull a cosine out easily. You know what I'm saying? I've seen this done several ways. This is a pretty classic problem, actually. It's pretty, pretty uh, common. In fact, I believe it might even be worked out in your book. Secant cubed? Someone have their book with them? No. no? Oh, sorry, that's right. It's, you have your book online, right? OK, let me show you a different approach. Can I show you a different approach? Let's, again, just on that one right there. And. I'm not showing you this because it's guaranteed that it's going to get you there. It's just I want you to see, oh, I do. I don't know how y'all do integration by parts. I do it this way. I write down, I make my choice of what my u and what my dv are. OK? So I'm splitting it still. Let's just try this, see what happens. I have to choose one of those to be u, right, and one of those to be dv. Am I speaking a language that you don't understand when I say that? Yes? OK. So I have some choices, right? So we're starting from here, not from the original problem? No. I mean, yeah, I'm starting from here. Just to see, can we have, because this is the biggest problem. If you can handle secant cubed, you can handle, you can handle this problem. Um, yeah, let's let u be secant x, and let's let dv be secant squared x dx. Let's just try this and see what happens. So the derivative of this, what's du, is secant x tangent x dx. And then what's up here? V is tan x. And then do we get anywhere here? This is now u times v, so it's these two secant x tangent x minus the integral of tangent squared secant x dx. Agreed? 
And now do that thing that you were doing earlier. Turn this into, right, turn that into secant x minus 1. So I'm going to keep moving this through. This left side right here. And then this is equal to secant x tangent x and then minus integral tangent squared is secant squared x minus 1 and then secant x dx distributing through right we will have minus integral secant cubed x right minus secant x dx let me keep bringing this. You see it, right? It's, it's about to appear on the other side. Yeah. And then we're going to bring it over. But I'm going to finish it out. I don't want to just tell you. I may as well just finish it. Secant cubed x dx equals secant x tangent x. My marker's running out. Splitting this into two separate integrals now. Right, two separate integrals. I will have this is equal to secant x tangent x minus integral secant cubed x dx, then plus integral secant x dx. This one we're good with. We add this to both sides. When I add that integral to both sides, I'm just going to do that. Add this integral right here. Add it over here. They're identical, right? So I'll have two of them. So two of these is equal to secant x tangent x plus, and then what was the antiderivative of that? Ln secant x plus tangent x, right, plus the constant, and then just multiply everything by a half. Make sense? Yeah. That's a tricky problem. The, the, the fact you ran into that and had trouble is pretty normal.